so there will be some short time for discussion. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So thanks a lot for this thought-provoking lecture. There's now time for discussion. Uh, I see already the first hand raised. Please. Uh, for those who didn't hear, it was a question about the free trade agreements that are currently being uh, negotiated. Um, one of the reasons why it's difficult to come to a clear view on that is because uh, they're being negotiated in a very undemocratic way. Uh, that should give you a little bit of my flavor of my view on this. Um, there's a lack of transparency both on the part of the Trans-Pacific uh, negotiations, TPP, and uh, those in Europe. Let me, though, highlight what I see as the major danger, uh, and that is the following. That it used to be that the trade agreements, the main point of a trade agreement was that there would be a reduction in tariffs on both sides. As tariffs come, come down, consumers get goods in both countries at a lower price. So consumers are the unintended beneficiaries of these in trade agreements. And let me make it clear that the trade negotiations tend to be are between the trade ministers, in the case of the U.S., we call it not a trade minister, but the U.S. trade representative, and those represent special producer interests. Um, we make it very explicit in the United States by often, uh, by sometimes appointing uh, the campaign manager or the president to be the U.S. trade representative, to repay the debts that he accumulated in his campaign. Uh, but it's very clear that these are, are not about free trade, they're about managed trade, and they're about managed trade in terms of those special interests. But we're entering a new era in trade negotiations because the tra tariffs have come very far down. And we're now talking about non-tariff barriers. But what are the most important non-tariff barriers? They're regulations. They're regulations about health, consumers, um, environment, the workplace. The producers in both countries would like to get rid of these regulations. But these regulations are there, they may not be perfect, but they're there for a reason. For one reason or another, we've been worried about the market protecting safety, the environment, one thing or another. So let me just give you an example. We know a little bit more about the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, because it's further advanced than the European. Uh, the U.S. has been uh, one, one of the provisions in these trade agreements are uh, provisions related to uh, are, are called investment uh, uh, agreements. And under these investment agreements, uh, companies like uh, our tobacco companies are suing other countries, are, are Companies can sue a state, they're called a state investor dispute. Uh, uh, they sue to get rid of their uh, regulations uh, about tobacco. Because they say these regulations that discourage people from buying tobacco are an interference in free trade. Well, yes, they are, but they're interference designed to protect health and they're not directed at imports, they're directed at any, any production. Um, and, and to me, they, they, they're, they're reminiscence, you know, the, uh, I don't know if you know the history of trade opening initiatives. One of the first trade, and open, uh, trade opening initiatives was by the European powers in China. And it had to do with uh, problems of global imbalances uh, in the 19th century. Uh, the problem was that uh, China had many good things that Europe and America wanted, like China. And um, 
Europe and America didn't produce anything that China wanted. And so you had an imbalance between exports and imports. And then somebody discovered a brilliant idea. Why don't our ships on the way to China pick up opium in Afghanistan and ship it to China, get them all addicted to opium, and they will have an assured market for our products. And that will rectify the trade imbalance. Well, after a while, China figured out this wasn't so good, you know, for China. <laughs> so it said, you know, we don't want your opium. The response to the West was, that's an unfair trade regulation. <laughs> and in those days, rather than sending the trade minister to negotiate, they fought a war. It was called the Opium War. And the West won. China lost in many, many ways because they then had to accept the opium. Well, that's the beginning of trade opening, and the United States is now continuing that tradition. Um, there are many other aspects of, of, uh, uh, of this. In the case of the environment, they're trying to persuade, they're trying to demand that, Ch that Japan not get, to get rid of its regulations that are trying to prevent big cars polluting the atmosphere. And they say that's a trade interference because Detroit knows how to make big cars. But Japan says, we don't want big cars that pollute. We want small cars. Well, the U.S. views that as an interference in free trade. I view it as a rightful regulation to protect the world, let alone to protect Japan. So we're entering a new era where much of the, the, much of the negotiations will be at the expense of consumers, the environment, and so I think it's going to be very, very important to get engaged. One other example, I, I know I'm going too long on this, but one other example, when I'm in France, the big issue there is the cultural exception. Uh, France feels very, very strongly that it should have the right to maintain its cultural identity, and part of their cultural identity is uh, watch is French films. I don't know what your views about French films are, whether you think they're boring or not, uh, <laughs> but if France wants to maintain a cultural identity with films that are French, uh, <laughs> that should be their right. But uh, uh, the United States Hollywood believes that uh, that's unfair competition with Terminator 5. Uh, and that uh, it's unfair competition. It's one thing for us to subsidize cotton and to subsidize grain and all that kind of stuff, but for France to subsidize these poor films, that's unacceptable. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and, uh, so that's, you know, and, and the reality is that, that this is not going to change the entertainment industry of the world. The French subsidies are not going to to destroy the uh, competitive attraction of Terminator 5. Um, and I think there are basic values at stake. And the same thing in intellectual property. So I, I would say to Europe, uh, enter these negotiations with care. Okay, there's one question here and then here. And here, so we should collect, so, uh, questions and then yeah, okay. you give a short answer. Right? Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm so <laughs> well, you <ha> <laughs> okay. What about taxes? <laughs> okay, that's a short question, but so we can have another one. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to probe you a little bit on that small mistake of the euro. So you seem to suggest that there's nothing that cannot be solved with more European solidarity, and I agree with that intellectually, but I think if you're politically realistic, I don't think it's gonna be forthcoming. I don't see large checks being written by German politicians to subsidize, for example, the Spanish or Greek unemployed. So if you think about their perspective, you put yourself in the shoes of a 30-year-old Spaniard or Greek head of household who has no prospect of employment, would it not be better if their countries left the Eurozone altogether, go through what is certainly going to be a wrenching adjustment, but then actually returns to something like growth instead of waiting for that never forthcoming European solidarity, which was implicit in the Euro deal and which is just not happening. 
There was one other question here, yes, over there. Okay, yeah, fourth question, then we have to stop because of memory limits, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using pen, <laughs> old fashioned. <laughs> okay. Thanks for the lecture, Professor Stiglitz. What do you think should be the optimal structure for the relationship between Switzerland and the European Union? <laughs> <laughs> okay, floor is yours. <laughs> <laughs> A little questions. Okay, <laughs> taxes. Okay. Um, the general principle is that other people should pay for them. <laughs> uh, no, uh, more seriously, um, a major issue that all countries face is uh, how to design a fair and efficient tax system. Uh, uh, the, um, the most successful countries do raise significant amounts in taxes because there are lots of what economists call public goods. You need infrastructure, public education, uh, investments in basic research. Most of the important innovations in the world in recent time have been based on publicly supported research. Uh, you shouldn't just rely on UBS. You should have uh, strong government support for uh, Ernst's... Uh, uh, that was an unpaid um, uh, advertisement. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the point, you know, things like the, discover, the discovery... Um, uh, of, of DNA, uh, the, 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 the development, the internet, um, you know, all these things on which the private sector relies are basically, are based all, are, are based on basic research that has to be publicly funded. So in all of this, a successful country, I think, requires uh, a, a significant public sector. The exact size is one that each country needs to debate. But if you're going to have a fiscally responsible uh, economy, you have to have taxes to finance these productive investments. So the question is, what kind of tax system uh, should you have? I think that given the extent of inequality that has emerged, uh, that uh, it's very important to have a progressive tax system. One of the major problems in uh, the United States and many other countries is that we've created tax systems that are full of, of exceptions and exemptions that distort the economy and actually interfere with the efficiency of the economy. For instance, in the United States, uh, speculators are taxed at a fraction of the, t uh, of the rate at which uh, people who work for a living get taxed. Uh, you know, Warren Buffett pointed out that there's something wrong with a tax system in which he pays a lower tax than, he pays a lower tax on his reported income than his secretary pays, tax rate uh, than his secretary pays. Um, one of the presidential candidates openly admitted that he paid under 15% of his income in taxes, much lower than people with a much lower income. I mean, his income was in the hundreds of mil uh, millions. And that he kept his money in the Cayman Islands. Now, he didn't keep it in his Cayman Islands because sunshine grows better. It makes, <laughs> makes money grow better. Uh, he kept his money there because of the lack of sunshine. So... Um, <laughs> uh, what we're talking here about here are large sums of money. Just a few weeks ago, the Congressional Budget Office estimated that eliminating some, not all, some of the special provisions for the treatment of capital gains and dividends would raise, you know, without raising the rates, but just eliminating the special provisions, would raise $2 trillion over the next 10 years. Now, just to put in perspective, $2 trillion is a lot of money, even for a rich country, and would make a very big dent in, in our uh, deficit problem. So the, more broadly, there are a whole range of taxes 
that can actually increase the efficiency of our economy. The most important of which is environmental taxes. We ought to have a carbon tax. Uh, and uh, because the emission of carbon imposes costs in our society, very significant costs. And so by taxing something that's bad, we do two things simultaneously. We get revenue and we discourage the bad thing. So um, that's, in brief, my view on taxes. Uh, the uh, second question is about uh, the political, uh, where the politics of Europe is going to go and what are the implications of that for countries, w the reality of that for countries like Spain and Greece. Uh, I want to make one comment first. As I said in my talk, the reality is that if the reforms that I described were made, Germany would not have to write large checks. It's more likely to wind up paying a high cost for not making these reforms. So there's a, a real element of, of, of uh, a failure to take into account Germany's own self-interest. But I think your description of the reality of, of the way the dialogue has been going in Germany is absolutely correct. And one of the reasons I'm uh, a little uh, depressed about uh, uh, the future of Europe. Um, I think uh, it's going to be a hard row to, to persuade Germany to make these reforms, even if they were costless. And that leaves Spain and Greece with uh, an important uh, uh, debate, uh, a qu policy question. What should they do if the reality is that there won't be these reforms? To me, the real risk is the following. Europe is going to dangle out just enough hope that Spain and Greece and the other periphery countries will say, oh, they're going to come to our assistance. And you have to remember in some of the countries, like in Spain, the remember, there, there's still the memory of the fascist past. And so things are a lot better than they were under Franco, you know, so, so you, you can't escape that, those kinds of, of memories. But they're going to dangle just enough hope that people won't want to leave the euro. But in fact, so little reform that it will be literally no time soon that they will emerge from their depression. So my advice would be very much along what I think you're, you were hinting at, that uh, they probably should face the reality that uh, there is not going to be a political reform that will make the euro viable for the periphery, for these other countries, that the other things like what I call internal devaluation won't work, and that uh, leaving the euro will be painful, but staying in the euro will be more painful. Among economists, there's an easier solution that many people have argued that Germany should leave. And the reason I say that is that if Germany leaves, then the euro will, the value of the euro will go down, the competitiveness of the southern the countries will become substantially enhanced. They can design a set of economic policies that work for this large group of countries. And that they, owing money in euros, they'll be able to repay that money in euros. Uh, and that Germany is a lot better position to absorb and the, fact, uh, the, the, the consequence of, of, of the breakup in that fashion. Uh, but I haven't seen a lot of discussion uh, in Germany along those lines. <laughs> Finally, let me just mention um, that what Argentina has shown is that there's life after debt default and uh, devaluation. Uh, in the period after uh, Argentina 
uh, broke the peg with the dollar and restructured its debt, it grew at 8 to 9% a year until the global financial crisis. Now, the fact that in the last few years, it's not actually performed very well and uh, uh, pursued some policies that are mistaken can't be blamed on, you know, the, the fact that it, that it did things what, right for a while and then it started doing things not so right. Uh, you can't blame the current problems on, on that. It was, it was the, 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 a really change in economic policies that began with the global economic crisis. And that leads to the uh, answer to the other question. Uh, national currencies can work on their own. Um, and uh, they give a, a degree of, of, of flexibility uh, that uh, even small countries uh, have learned how to manage their own cu currency. I mean, for instance, the United States neighbor to the north, Canada, has, is a small country, about 10% of the size of the United States, uh, but it has its own currency and has managed it very well to its advantage. So um, the, the idea that these separate countries could could have their, their own currencies uh, is actually uh, correct. In fact, there's, there's uh, uh, the argument that there are significant advantages to, to sharing a common currency uh, is at best questionable. If you look at the overall benefits that Europe has enjoyed, the Eurozone has enjoyed from having a current cur currency, looking at, at it from 2000 to say 2014, I think net you would say it's probably been a negative. So um, uh, I think that having uh, national currency is, is certainly uh, uh, viable. The final one is a really big question is what should be the relationship between Switzerland and the EU? Um, I think basically a small economy like Switzerland has to be open. Um, one has to, you, you can't survive as a closed economy, and EU surrounds you, you're, you're, you know, so, so in that sense, there, there has to be uh, a, a uh, you have to be economically integrated, but that doesn't mean that there would be any advantages of sharing a currency, for instance, that there would be, uh, and that there are certain advantages of maintaining a distinct uh, economic framework for instance, um, of maintaining a, a set of uh, regulations uh, in a whole variety of areas where uh, 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 the values and the interest of, of Swiss citizens and how they view a whole set of issues may be markedly different from those in, in other countries uh, in Europe. And it seems to me that, that uh, as long as there is a broadly open framework, uh, one can get the advantages of both having uh, a kind of independence of national economic policy and the larger market uh, that globalization uh, has afforded. That's a very good ending. Thank you very much. <laughs>